I want to say hello to everyone. My name is Gerard Robinson. I'm the Vice President for Education at the Advanced Studies and Culture Foundation located in beautiful Charlottesville, Virginia. I'm also a fellow of practice at the Institute for Advanced Studies and Culture at the University of Virginia. Uh, I come together with good people every month to have conversations about education and society. And in particular for this month being Black History Month, it provides a slice of time to talk about the role that Black people, Black institutions across the board and across history have actually invested into the creation of the United States of America. Well, for today's event, we're going to talk about HBCUs, second chances, and the role that these institutions play in uh, the lives of incarcerated people. We have people, and I'm going to introduce them in a second, uh, who've been involved with this work at different levels, some at HBCUs, some not at HBCUs, but who are actively involved in the work. Uh, many of us know that there are 2.3 million people, as we speak right now, who find themselves uh, behind federal, state, uh, and local uh, um, uh, bars incarcerated. We know that there at least, there's at least 2 million children, as we speak right now, who have a parent who is incarcerated. But the one thing that we often don't talk about are the role that higher education institutions play in trying to deal with issues of rehabilitation, justice, equity, second chances and fairness. And within the last 10 years, there's been a major push uh, for bipartisan support to really reimagine what we think about uh, imprisonment and what we think about the role in education in it. And I'm proud to say that there are HBCUs before we had uh, the creation of the Second Chance Pill Initiative and during that have made it a part of their mission to be involved in second chances. And so I'm joined by some people today who I know, and uh, they're going to talk to us about their work. So I'm going to just introduce the people, and then we will go into uh, a Q&A. So we have Dr. Tracy Andrus, who's a professor of criminal justice and a director of the Lee T. Brown Criminal Justice Institute at Wiley College in Texas, where he's seen a lot more snow in the last Absolutely. two weeks. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Also yeah. got Dr. Aaron Colbert, who's the founder and CEO of the Second Chance Educational Alliance. We have President Jerome Green of Shorter College in Arkansas. He's also seen more snow than usual. We have Dr. Bahai Muhammad, who is an assistant professor of criminology at Howard University. She's also a fellow here at the Institute for Advanced, for Advanced Studies and Culture. And we have um, Dean Joshua Snavely, who is actually at Langston University in Oklahoma. He's also seen some great deal of snow. I want to welcome you to the center's uh, event focused on second chances in HBCUs. Again, thank you for having you here. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thank you. So let me also thank the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative for making this event possible. They're the sponsor of what we're going to talk about today. So let me just open up an opportunity for the viewing uh, audience to know more about you as a person. Uh, all of you are involved in education. Uh, at different levels, at different points, but all of you are also involved in in prison uh, or in jail education. But you had a personal journey that led from where you grew up to this point now. And so what I want to do is I'll start off with uh, you, Dr. Andrus. Who's Dr. Andrus and what attracted you to this line of work? Yes, sir. Thank you for asking. Uh, I am Trace Andrus, Director of Lee P. Brown Criminal Justice Institute. Uh, what really drew me to this line of work is actually uh, when I was in prison, personally myself, I spent three years in prison on a 57 year sentence uh, in the Louisiana Department of Corrections and in the Texas Department of Corrections. And one of the things that really got my attention is when I went to prison, I did not realize that there were that many African Americans locked up in the penitentiary. In Louisiana, every every prison that I went to, because they transfer you quite often, uh, there were about 70 to 80 percent of the population were actually African American males. And you know, I said to myself, man, this is where all the people are at. You know, we're talking about thousands of people, and it really got my attention. Uh, and I promised God that if He would allow me to get out of prison that you don't have to worry about me coming back. Not, not, in, not with handcuffs on anyway, but hey, got out and uh, everything else is history. I went to school, I earned my associate's, bachelor's, master's, and became the first African-American in the United States to earn a PhD in juvenile justice from Prairie View a and University. I've been director of criminal justice at Wiley now going on 15 years. 
Uh, I also served as executive director of the Center for Correctional Education Research here in Marshall, Texas also. That's Trace, that's Trace Andrews. Mm -hmm. My stepdad is from Marshall, Texas, so it's always good to see someone from that part of the world. Awesome. So Aaron, uh, good to see you. Uh, well, you're in Connecticut, so you see snow with some great regularity. Who is Aaron and how did you get involved in this work? Thank you, Gerard. It's, it's good to be seen. Um, so my place in this work is, is both, is equal parts personal and professional. Um, I've been an educator since graduating from undergrad at Swarthmore College. I majored in psychology and education. Um, and so I just, I don't know how to do anything other than teach. Um, and so that just really um, prepared me for the work that I'm doing now. Her, um, personally, I have an uncle who is serving a life sentence in Florida, a life sentence that was commuted from the death penalty to life without parole. I have a number of friends and family who um, are formerly incarcerated, currently and formerly incarcerated. And I also um, had a cousin who did 12 years for a, a sexual conviction. When he was released, he really had a lot of troubles reacclimating to the community and things that he wanted to do educationally, he couldn't do because of the collateral consequences around his conviction. Um, and so he ultimately ended up taking his life because he just didn't have um, the support. I don't think he felt he had the support that he needed to be successful. And so every student that I interact with, you know, I'm like, if I can just provide some network, some semblance of a network of support, some kind of um, community outreach, then, then I'm doing what I've been put here to do. Well, Dr. Cobra, first of all, thank you for opening up your personal story as well as your professional, because people often, uh, for a host of reasons, don't share uh, the suicide aspects that come along with people who leave. So thank you for opening that up. President Green. Yes, sir. My story is a little different. I spent the vast majority of my career as a licensed attorney. Um, uh, doing litigation and uh, in the civil litigation uh, and business litigation and representing professional people. Uh, and uh, so uh, like uh, Saul in the Bible had a uh, Damascus Road experience and became Paul and uh, uh, experienced a call to ministry. So in addition to a licensed attorney, I am an ordained uh, minister of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, and uh, that mission uh, of the AME Church uh, compels me uh, to do something more than, uh, than uh, pursue activities that would benefit me. And so I was uh, attracted uh, toward um, economic development, then uh, ultimately to education. And then I was invited uh, to come back to uh, Little Rock uh, and uh, serve as president of Shorter College. So our, and the, our mission uh, uh, is to uh, provide an, a path to possible uh, for opportunity for those who would otherwise have been uh, excluded. And of course, that's the historical mission of all HBCUs. Uh, and uh, so uh, to be in this space with the incarcerated persons is simply pushing the envelope uh, uh, of, of, of uh, broadening the net uh, to, to include persons who even our institutions uh, with that mission were not including. Uh, and of course, uh, I find it extremely fulfilling uh, because in the course of doing that, we have an opportunity to help make America better because a huge human resource uh, that has been lost uh, can be reclaimed. When you mentioned uh, the AME Church, I think of uh, Richard Allen, Adam, oh, well, Richard Allen, Allen yes. Absalom Jones, and the work of a number of African American women uh, in that church long before the Civil War, who would push for education when it was illegal, and even with the rise of prisons uh, in Pennsylvania, and particularly, uh, I guess, the Eastern model, 
they were also involved with helping the families and children of those who were caught up as well. So AME's had a long role. Dr. Muhammad, what's your story? Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's great to hear all of the stories. Uh, my story started with my sister attending Seton Hall University. She had a minor in criminal justice and she was an intern at a juvenile justice facility. And she often would come home very tired, very exhausting and sharing stories on the phone with one of her friends. So it wasn't something that we talked about, but she would often talk with her friends. When I attended undergrad at Rutgers University in New Brunswick, I took a undergraduate course called Prisons and Prisoners. And the professor took us on a tour. That was the first time as an undergrad that I entered into the carceral space and it sparked my interest. I, I didn't realize at that time that that was so many black individuals that were incarcerated. I remember looking around and thinking that I was the only African-American individual on that particular trip. And then I was connected to all of the brothers uh, in this particular facility that were incarcerated. And I remember being ashamed of wanting to make eye contact with the individuals to kind of give my respect and say, you know, hello. I remember thinking um, as we rode on the bus down, there was so much excitement. And for me, I wasn't excited. I was more interested to see what was going on. And more so after it was such a traumatic experience that really um, I still hold um, as I continue to work to build uh, programming around this area. But that experience, I didn't know where to put it. I didn't know. Um, who to talk to necessarily about it. It was a, a class trip, individuals enjoyed it. And we didn't dialogue on our personal experiences and our personal connections to the actual system itself. Um, since then, as an undergrad, I've had family members that have been directly impacted and it gives me an opportunity to gain a better understanding around the importance of the work in this area. Now I'm taking my own students on tours to facilities across the world to see incarceration in, in different, uh, from different vantage points and then being able to have conversations about it. Look forward to more learning more about uh, some of the trips that you've taken. Uh, in fact, um, Dr. Muhammad and I are actually scheduled to travel to uh, Germany and Brazil uh, when things change to talk about uh, the international perspective. Dean Stavley, what's your story? Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks, Gerard. I want to first just say thank you for this opportunity and Gerard's sort of um, consistent and passionate advocacy for this cause and bringing us together today uh, to have this conversation. I also want to thank sort of at the outset um, uh, my president, Kent Smith, Dr. Kent Smith, and Dr. Ruth Ray Jackson, our vice president for academic affairs, who really shaped the vision for Langston getting involved in this and we wouldn't be here today without it. So as for me and my journey, like uh, President and the Reverend Green, uh, I'm a recovering lawyer. Um, I uh, spent a lot of time in and out of um, the, the practice of law. And I first started my, my journey in this space actually by meeting John Grisham um, back um, uh, over a decade ago when he came to Oklahoma to speak about uh, the book, his nonfiction work, The Innocent Man, and the case of Carl Fontenot, who was um, wrongfully convicted and has since been found innocent. I had the privilege of serving uh, as a part of that effort to launch the Oklahoma Innocence Project and the Oklahoma Justice Commission and do a lot of work in Oklahoma, which we need a lot of help. Um, we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but uh, in those experiences, getting to meet Carl, uh, getting to meet many of the other persons in Oklahoma who'd been wrongfully convicted, I started to see a through line in that experience around education, um, both before uh, these persons went uh, to prison, during their time, and then after, and, and the real value uh, of education, both before and during, uh, and in some cases, the lack thereof. And uh, that's when I started to get passionate about this program, when I uh, joined the team at Langston, and we launched uh, our efforts in the spring of 2017, um, said, well, if, if we're going to do this, I'm going to get the, get in the classroom myself um, and, and really see what that was like. I had been 
uh, in those justice and innocence project uh, efforts for many years, uh, but wanted to see this side of it and uh, taught my first class in the fall of, of 2017. And I knew I was gonna be hooked. Um, it was a sad day, but ended up as an educator being a great day. Came to class um, shortly after the Las Vegas shooting. So this was uh, that fall of 2017. And all of my students were ready to talk about how um, we could potentially sue the uh, hotel, the MGM, for inadequate security measures. So the, the students in my um, second chance class were there and ready and had all the, the briefs ready and all the discussion and, and the dialogue. And, and quite frankly, we were more prepared than some of my law students I've taught in the past. And I just I had real special people and, and um, my love for these programs grew that fall and uh, have been a part of it ever since. So glad to be here and look forward to the conversation. Well, Dean, thanks for talking about your early work with the Innocence Project, because when we discuss education inside of prison, it's not a silo. It's part of a much larger uh, ecosystem of criminal justice reform writ large. And this is just one of the lanes that we walk. And so for those of you who are watching or those of you who will uh, watch or listen later, you see that we've had people who come to this uh, through different professional and uh, academic lanes. So let me go to the you know, first group question. Um, Congress uh, in the latter part of last year lifted the ban on Pell Grants, uh, something that had been in place going back to the 1994 uh, Criminal Justice uh, Act. And we know from uh, research from Vera that approximately 460,000 people uh, would qualify for that who are currently incarcerated. But we know there's conversations now from the regulatory side, the DOE side, what will that look like moving ahead? At the same time, you have a number of philanthropic groups, uh, state focused, national, who are investing billions of dollars annually uh, across the board to figure out what can we do to address education inside of prison, be it um, adult basic education, adult secondary educational, education, vocational education, or post-secondary. We also know that the Biden administration has given some positive nods uh, to the role that it could play, uh, not only in the Pell Grant conversation, but also in criminal justice reform in general and the role that education can play in it. Given the work that you do uh, in this space, how should federal government, how should philanthropists think about how to consider what to do to support people who are incarcerated? I'll just leave it open to whoever wants to go first. I think I'll, I'll step in. Um, I think the first step is to recognize that suggestions and recommendations for Pell implementation in particular need to come directly from the field. And the field is very broadly defined as practitioners, program administrators, um, you know, the various departments and higher ed institutions, but also the students, right? There's a lot, there are a lot of instances where I think it's very easy to just kind of think that teaching inside, teaching students inside is just like teaching a, a seamlessly transitioned 18 year old who is starting college and that is not the case. Adults learn differently. There's a whole different, you know, sort of cadre of research out there on teaching adults. And part of that information, part of the research in that space outlines that students learn best when they are part of the process. And so to the extent that we can have um, recommendations for guidelines that come from all of these different constituents, including higher ed policy experts, because often there's a disconnect between those who are teaching and those who understand how Title IV works. It's, it's not always this kind of, we know everything at all times. We each bring a different set of expertise to the conversation and we've got to start getting together to have these open kinds of conversations so that we are not putting ourselves in a situation where we are looking to broader organizations, larger, or larger organizations to set our agenda, to tell us what we need to do, et cetera, et cetera. We as the field, the shorter colleges, the Langstons, the Wileys, the, the Howard Universities, the, the students in those programs, we need to be the ones setting the agenda so that these other organizations that want to support the work can in fact support it and not drive it. Excellent points. 
I would like to add to that, uh, to say that, you know, it would be wonderful to have uh, the philanthropists engage with each other, to have conversations. Um, a lot of the call for uh, programming and papers and those that are going for the funds become a competition um, amongst those that are working on the community. I wonder if you would get more bang for your buck with those individuals kind of talking through and talking about ways that things are not replicated and organizations and institutions aren't favored over others, but really creating an opportunity for equity across the band and literally holding hands to be able to do that in the ways that we're seeing universities work together. Um, I would also uh, like to see programs that are tied into institutions of higher learning. For example, we see a lot of innovative uh, programming that comes out of uh, Dr. Corbett's uh, model in Connecticut, as well as others, where it really ties into reentry. The community is able to engage in ways that politically the institutions of higher education are not. And I think being able to fund those partnerships where it kind of bridges the divide between the researcher and the practitioner or the Institute of Higher Learning and the community organization and allows them through philanthropy um, frameworks to work together over the long term. Great, thank you. Personally, uh, I'm in the state of Texas and you know, just it's evident even from this week that our infrastructure is really deteriorating. We need help in that area. But one of the things that I would like to see is philanthropists and the federal government work with industry to try to help those when, when we educate our people who are in prison and they get out of out of jail or out of prison they need a job and a lot of times you know the the these some of these trades are regulated to the extent where you know they have the education they have the apprenticeship and electric electric plumbing hvac carpentry but they cannot take the state exam because they have a felony record. I believe that we should put some emphasis, you know, on our legislators to say, hey, these people paid that debt to society, allowed them to work in these various trades that you all have invested money in them to get uh, these kind of certification, allow them to work. And, you know, w building wind turbines here in Texas would be a great thing for many of our guys coming out of prison, things of that nature, green energy, we want to see them work in these various areas, but we have to take remove the barriers that prevent these people or our people from getting out and earning a livable wage. That's where we are at Wiley College and uh, here in, in Texas, man, we, we love the educational principles that, that are put in place, but we have to make sure that when we educate uh, our students and they get out, that they have an opportunity to really work in the trades that they've been educated in. Thank you. Well, there are, are several issues uh, uh, I think that that uh, we should be legitimately concerned about. Let, let me just take an easy one. Uh, the, the, the funding for wraparound services. Uh, uh, teaching this population is more than just opening a book and given an election. Uh, uh, this population has, uh, they have needs uh, uh, that revolve around uh, self-esteem, around being recognized uh, as equal human beings uh, and not objectified. Uh, they have uh, uh, a need to be able to overcome uh, uh, many things that uh, helped to put them in prison uh, in the first place that comes from living in a society uh, as, um, as an oppressed people. Uh, so uh, wraparound services is something uh, that funding should be made available for and Title IV does not do that. Uh, uh, so, so that's one source. Another issue uh, would be standards. Um, right now, the institutions that are able to um, uh, to serve and operate in this space 
have been pre-selected and designated by the U.S. Department of Education. Um, and so who's going to make the decision about who is going to operate in this space uh, as we go forward where, it, where the operators have not been pre-selected uh, by the uh, U.S. Department of Education. Um, I, I don't think I have to tell anybody that state contracting uh, is extremely political. Uh, right. And uh, uh, there, there is a possibility that HBCUs who are very good at this uh, may find uh, uh, a less friendly atmosphere uh, in terms of opportunity to operate in this space. Uh, uh, when, uh, no, when, when the states are left to their own devices. Uh, uh, a third issue I would uh, mention would be standards. Um, uh, I think that we can expect uh, for-profit institutions uh, using distance learning to immediately proliferate uh, seeking to, uh, to um, uh, take advantage of a new mar market of vulnerable uh, students. Uh, and so the quality of the education that uh, would be provided uh, is something that, um, that uh, a very strong look uh, of standards uh, should also be uh, uh, part of the consideration. Thank you. So kind of synthesize a couple of points there. I think, um, you know, to, to Dr. Corbett's point, I think when we first got in and, you know, we had this, the, the Pell piece was lifted and, oh, great, you know, we're ready to go and we have our model. And, and we quickly learned that the model we use uh, in, in our, on our main campus and urban campus locations was not fit for uh, teaching in these programs from a resource standpoint, especially. So I, I would highlight sort of in, the, in, in thinking about the resource standpoint from the perspective of you know, state and local government who aren't always as supportive as the federal government has been uh, in, in this area, philanthropists. There's three areas we've seen where we need additional investment and help. One, staff, right? So having adequate staff to work in these programs. So if you think about college now is so intertwined with um, you know, computer systems and platforms and technology. And, and essentially in many of these programs, you have to divorce the program from that and go back to the old school paper, right? And you're searching for transcripts and you're looking for you know, selective service records and all kinds of things manually that we don't, we've gone away from, you know, we've worked hard in education to go away from in the last few years. So at least in the, in the short term, investing in, in staffing and resources to help uh, institutions cover that gap. Hopefully long-term, there's some ways to integrate um, from, technology, from a technology standpoint. And that transitions to my second point, which is technology. I mean, if you think about some of these underfunded technology resources in education generally, now go to a Department of Corrections facility and try to teach a class on an old school projector with um, you know, some of the technology we haven't seen since the 70s or 80s. And now you're dealing with network issues and security issues and data privacy issues. So I think one of the things we need to do at the state level, philanthropists can help with is investing in technology platforms that uh, help that. Um, I know some states are set up to take that kind of assistance, some are not. And so we, we should look at ways to do that, but that's a critical piece to our success in these programs. And the last thing I would say is uh, along the same lines, those learning resources. So um, books, and uh, I know, I think um, Wiley has done this, Shorter has and others have, have started to be able to use some kind of iPad or technology device. Some prisons don't allow that. 
Um, and so, you know, I, I have faculty that are hand copying everything uh, that they have to take into the prison <laughs> that day, right? And mounds and papers and, and that, that makes your job really difficult um, when you're already, you know, facing other, other barriers. So if we can find ways to, to make investments there, um, I think almost always they, they pay dividends. And, and one of the things we've seen is really working, especially if, if administrators can work closely with wardens um, to build trust and build relationships, some of those barriers have begun to, to be broken down. And in, in our case, as I've had conversations with our wardens, they start to see a difference in their population through these programs. And they have been supportive because of um, the transformation that's happening inside the prison. Um, but I, th I think those are three areas I'd, I'd highlight to, to get us started as ways that um, uh, people with influence, philanthropy can help invest in these programs. Thank you. So Dr. Corbett, thank you so much for mentioning that what we're talking about is a higher education program. It's just not higher education people stepping in. And there's a distinction because this really is an adult education program. And so thanks for making that point and also talking about a possible uh, uh, title line that we can look at for funding. Uh, Dr. Muhammad, I want to thank you for talking about the importance of philanthropy, but also having philanthropy uh, talk across the board. You know, we've had philanthropists, uh, Chan Zuckerberg Initiatives One, Mellon Foundation, Laughing Gold here in Virginia and an earlier part of the Sunshine Lady Foundation. There are a lot of foundations, but an aha moment for me is when you mention that is to make sure that at times they get together so that we're not often crossing over in that area. President Green, you've also had experience working in government. Two things you mentioned, really clear. Um, contracts and procurement process can be political. And so one of the things we have to make sure is to realize that if we're not at the table, we're on the menu. And so I know the work that you've done at your institution is to make sure where those conversations are happening, that Shorter College uh, is at the table, but also to talk about just the world of government and regulations. And Dean, I want to thank you for what you mentioned uh, about technology, because you know people I think are really shocked to know that you're having to handwrite notes or to handwrite pages to bring in to teach, because you don't have access to it. Someone once said the reason we can't do it is because it would give inmates uh, or people incarcerated access to porn. And I told someone it's already there if you're interested in that. That's not a reason not to have it. Um, I said this more that may have more to do with a political will issue because we now know there's companies like uh, the Artie Fence Company, American Data Prison System, where you can have a hell hand device, internet, internet to make that happen. And Dr. Andrews, I want to thank you for bringing this to a conversation about jobs. People, when they leave, should leave with the skill sets needed to go into either green jobs, blue collar jobs, white collar jobs, or otherwise. So let me go back to you, uh, President Green. As a president, you have a number of things to do. Trustees, you're responsible to state legislators and uh, lawmakers and others. But you decided, I'm going to be a part of the first 67 uh, schools that were chosen by the US Department of Education 2016. John King was the um, secretary at the time. His predecessor, Arnie Duncan, was supportive of the program. Out, uh, now, former secretary, Betsy DeVos, was supportive as well. Why would you decide that this is something Shorter College should be involved in with all the other things on your plate as president? Well mission. Uh, and it was a natural progression from something that we had already started to do. Uh, we had moved into this space uh, with uh, juvenile uh, education, but I'm talking about post-secondary education because there are a number of individuals, uh, not only in our state, but in other states who are in juvenile detention, have completed their high school diploma, or have obtained a GED, and are simply being warehoused in a juvenile detention facility uh, because they don't have time to get out. But they have exceeded all rehabilitation and um, improvement uh, programs that the juvenile facility has. And so uh, we worked with the state and I have to compliment um, the state of Arkansas uh, from 
the governor to the corrections department and to the juvenile uh, department, which is different. The juvenile is on the uh, human services. Um, but there has been a recognition um, that something is needed in this area. So we started uh, uh, in the juvenile detention facility and we gained the experience of going behind bars and providing a post-secondary uh, education product. And that allowed us to see what a difference it could make, not only for that individual, but for the other individuals who were their fellow residents to observe them and realize that there's hope and that there's opportunity. Uh, and then when those persons came out, uh, they received news media coverage uh, that they went on to the University of Arkansas or to other places and, and actually demonstrated that some of them were top scholars. Um, and so that allowed the state of Arkansas to have an eye-opening experience and it allowed us to have uh, experience so that when the uh, uh, opportunity for the experimental second chance pill uh, announcement was made, uh, we were ready uh, to occupy that space. And in fact, when you, you think of the initial 67 selected by the US Department of Education, uh, you were one of the ones who, who walked in with experience. Uh, there are a number of schools, this was their first entree uh, into prison education with no experience in juvenile justice or others. So that's a unique point to bring on board. Dr. Andrews, same question with you. People know Wiley College for a number of things. One would be the great debaters. Uh, maybe more, yeah. maybe more popular by Denzel Washington. Why did you decide to take this on? No, uh, that's a good question for us. And uh, you know, at, at the time that we wrote uh, the RFP, Dr. Haywood L. Strickland was our president at that time. And, you know, I, I, I wrote an academic paper called The Bomb of Gilead, where I referred to correctional education as the bomb in Gilead for those men who were serving time. Because, you know, I look at my personal life and know that, hey, look, you know, just because you uh, lose a battle doesn't mean you've lost the war. And, you know, you keep your confidence up and you keep moving. While at college stepped out, they really laid the groundwork. They allowed us to really go out and work with APDS. And, you know, we we really went out and talked to the men that were, and, and the women, because of course, you know, we were supposed to go in the women's facility also, but their facility was flooded and we didn't get a chance to go there. But we went out and we spoke with the wardens and the secretary of the Department of Correction. And uh, he agreed to it. And I like what uh, Mr. Snavely referred to when he said that we should work with Warren. Let me tell you something about Second Chance Pell that I know because we operate in three institutions. If a warden does not have buy-in to your program, some of them can look at you like, we are just waiting for you to fail. And they can make it very hard, they can press you. Whereas when someone really buy-in, and I know there are institutions that really bought in, they allow us space, we can go in, we, we really, can meet with the men and women and really work with them. That's very important when you're dealing with second chance pill because the quality of your program, you know, you have to have quality. And I like what uh, President Green said, you know, standards. You have to have standards in these programs. And if you're not allowed free access to your people, it's kind of hard to uh, accomplish your agenda, you know, your objectives that you set for your second chance pill program. So I would say this, you know, while in college stepped out, they allowed me to work as the first executive director for that program. We went in and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of what we've done thus far. I just wrote a piece for a academic journal where I talk about quality. Now that the, the ban has been lifted, we have to make sure that people are not taken advantage of, you know, you're talking about 460,000 additional people who may have access to this population. We want to make sure that people don't just come in and just for the money, take advantage of the, the men and women that we serve. We want to make sure that you give them a good education and then follow them. Make sure that they get jobs because I'm, I'm, 
I'm a stickler when it comes to, you know, education is great. And this is not just for second chance Pell. That's for anybody that go to college. You can get all the education in the world. If you get out and you still don't have a job, man, that's a problem. And I know that our government has to do a better job. The industry, the philanthropists, all of them have to do a better job of making sure that we remove barriers so people can work. That's my take on it. And you're involved, as you mentioned, you're involved right now with men's prisons. Initially, you were to go into a women's prison, but flood stopped that. When I had a chance to go to Arkansas, uh, I had a chance to visit a men's prison and a women's prison. So uh, Short is involved in both of those. Dean, same question for you. You know, Big State University, uh, doing great work. You decide to dive in. What were the factors? Yeah, so I echo what President Green said. I think mission is, is really you know, what um, we centered on when we heard about this opportunity. And I think I can maybe tell it best in a story. And, and Gerard, you had the chance to meet one of these individuals. So we've now taught in, in an all men's prison and in an all um, women's prison. So in my second round of classes, I taught sort of the introductory uh, college class to this group of, uh, I think, 17 uh, women so their their very first college class and um, twice a week they were there just like the others always prepared more prepared usually than I was even to teach and uh, on the I think on the third day I asked you know why are you here and I had them I had them all sort of write down uh, a message that uh, I could take back to the university and uh, never forget um, after they wrote it, I had them describe it, and that was one of their first times to ever present uh, in a in a classroom. Uh, and one woman said that this was the first time in her life, she was in her mid-30s with um, several kids, that anyone had ever believed in her. And if, if that's not a statement as to why we're all here today and why this program matters and why it matches our mission, I, I don't know what is. I think, um, you know, Langston, like many HBCUs for well over a hundred years has been a place of both excellence and opportunity and uh, for everyone. Uh, and that's really why we got involved in this is it we saw that as an opportunity. I, I would also say Oklahoma, unfortunately, um, is right there often with Louisiana as uh, one of the leaders in incarceration rates. I think we're now the leader, at least in the last uh, survey I saw. And one of the other parts of Langston's mission is about helping our state solve problems. And this is a problem, right? And, and we know that we can play a role in that, and we have. Um, our program's grown from seven students that very first semester uh, to, to over 100. We will hopefully um, this, this year, if everything works out, we've been a little challenged with the pandemic. That's a whole nother uh, panel to talk about doing this in the middle of a pandemic, but uh, we'll ho hopefully have our first graduate um, of the program. And, and he has a 3.9 plus GPA. And um, we also have now our first two students who are looking to enroll after being released from the program. So it, it's really it, um, a mission-based uh, effort for us. It's about changing our community, something we've been involved in, again, for over 100 years. And we just feel really fortunate to be a part of it. I would say one other thing, Gerard, I think that sort of an observation that I saw as we, we came in, and this, again, goes back to a point that both Dr. Corbett and Dr. Andrus made. I think sometimes one of my observations when we first went in was this dichotomy or maybe false choice that um, these programs are all or only about skills, right? Let, let's just give some skills to these prisoners. And certainly um, skill-based you know, programs, certifications are important, um, but we came in you know, from our, our typical liberal arts education view, right? That um, this is about educating people, not prisoners. And we didn't know any different. So we just sort of took it as we teach everyone else. And I think um, viewing that we can be both a place that 
you know, produces bachelor's degrees and skills and transforms the lives of these students. Um, you know, we, we've spent a lot of time, I know some of the Texas schools have done this too, is thinking about entrepreneurship and uh, coding and innovation. And I think sometimes when you think about these programs, we, um, some who aren't um, familiar with them kind of have an old mindset about um, the kinds of jobs or the kinds of opportunities we should be providing for these students. And, and I'm a believer, I know Langston is, that um, the sky is the limit. Now there's some challenges. I know I've seen in the chat about um, felonies and, and some laws that, that create some challenges, but from an educational standpoint, from an opportunity standpoint, there's really no limit to what these students can do. And the point I want to note um, for everyone is when the 67 were selected, there were only three who HBCUs and the three are on this call right now. So I want to thank them. We have some new uh, uh, HBCUs coming on board, University of Maryland, uh, East and Shirley, Claflin University uh, and, and others. And so this, it's going to move out. And the fact that you should also know that having visit um, prisons with, uh, with the Dean and with uh, the uh, president's team, the students they're serving are black, but it's also white, Hispanic. So of course, a number of Native Americans in Oklahoma. And so these are HBCUs working with just what America looks like. A number of them surely are African-American men and women. We just want to put that point in well. So Dr. Muhammad, let's go to you. You're in the HBCU as well, not one that's a part of the Second Chance Pill Initiative, but you've been doing a lot of work to give people second chances, in some instances, a first chance. Talk to us about uh, your work in this area. Absolutely. You know, uh, we applied for the second chance uh, funding, and I'm hoping with the new administration, we see an increase of individual uh, HBCU specific that are uh, funded in this area. One of the things that that was helpful for, as we know, uh, the more that you submit the grants, the greater your likelihood is, but it allowed for us as an institution to pull together an infrastructure and begin those kind of conversations. Um, and so what I've been doing over the last seven years at Howard University is creating uh, one of the longest comprehensive HBCU programs that works in the halfway houses with the juveniles, with the adult men and the women. And so going in and being able to uh, provide courses for them to engage in curriculums that they wouldn't necessarily get outside of a humanities curriculum. So for example, looking specifically at a model that utilizes dual enrollment. We just recently were selected uh, from Mellon as one of the Just Futures uh, recipients. And now our program is um, grant bearing, credit bearing. And so we're looking at the implementation of a social justice certificate. And it allows for us to be able to give incarcerated individuals one credit for a total of six classes that allowed them to begin to think about ways of solving the solutions in their own communities. And that's not waiting until reentry. We're also looking at that during incarceration. There are many individuals who are students among us who um, create resources on the inside when we can't get in. So they're holding those reading sessions and those dialogues and serving as the facilitators and the liaisons between the university when we're not able to enter. We know that that is a great need specifically now in the midst of COVID. Also through this opportunity, we are able to also offer uh, incarcerated scholar in residence fellowship. And that will allow for an incarcerated individual during their sentence to be able to receive a fellowship stipend. And right now we have that at $30,000. It's a national opportunity for individuals. And we're really looking at some of those really unique models where, for example, you see in DC uh, that the incarcerated individuals helped in the creating of the Young Men Emerging Unit which is a unit that has more than a hundred judges, more than a thousand students that have come. Um, all of the celebrities that are coming inside of the facility go directly into that unit. And it was co-created by an incarcerated individual. We also know that a lot of the programming that we're talking about here and also the training programs, the ideas were born out of the minds of the incarcerated brothers and sisters. And this gives um, incentive to that, to let individuals know that we can now begin implementing kind of a earn and learn process. So we know during incarceration, 
and in higher learning in general, students are able to have a work study opportunity. And that's something that we haven't seen implemented on the inside, where individuals are actually able to receive funding for these great ideas, for thinking, for implementing uh, things on the ground. And so I'm very excited about the work that we're doing in the juvenile justice system. We implemented a one credit. Uh, so we did start with a one credit and a lot of the detained youth were able to have that on their DCPS transcripts, which allowed them to then get accepted into UDC. Uh, we are working on a partnership now with them to create that pipeline. So specifically going in and allowing individuals an opportunity to really work on the GED and at the same time work toward beginning some of those one credit classes that they would be required to do once they go into college. And uh, we feel that this is going to be an incentive because oftentimes if individuals continue to fail the GED, they kind of give up and not see the future. But this would uh, give that opportunity. Um, just today on the front page of the New York Times, there's an article on the program that we um, implemented on uh, college and high school. And that literally is the model that we're using where we're finding that incarcerated individuals are dropping out of high school in the 11th and 12th grade. So the same way that I taught 100 uh, New York City high school students um, in my principles of criminal justice class, and now they're receiving three credits free for that, we're now working to implement that into the prison system. So those individuals who are active GED um, participants on the inside can take a one credit college course to learn how to write, to learn how to get their words out on paper, to learn that a syllabus is a contract and to get excited right, about education so that they're able to move beyond kind of that GED. And so I'm just very excited about being able to utilize this innovation and creativeness that was uh, grounded um, in Washington, D.C. for the last seven years, we were the first uh, higher education program in the facility uh, there and happy to be leading that charge uh, into this innovation and creative uh, model. And thanks so much for focusing on GED because a number of people who actually uh, go into our prison system arrive without any high school credential, GED or high school diploma. And there are a number of states who now require that if you arrive as such, you've got to go through the program. And when you look at the menu of educational options, the bulk are looking at GED and vocational. So thanks for that. So let's turn over to you, uh, Dr. Colbert, not affiliated with HBCU, but you're actually working with HBCUs. But at a broader sense, you've been involved with this in some very unique ways. So talk to us about your decision to found the Second Chance Educational Alliance and the kind of work you're doing to support the conversation uh, at hand. Sure, so um, the decision to start Second Chance Educational Alliance, initially we actually began or wanted to begin as sort of this educational consultant concierge service for people who were recently released and wanting to enroll in college, but just feeling very unfamiliar with the process, obviously with financial aid, et cetera. Uh, that failed <laughs> miserably um, because we had not done the, the sort of pre-work of establishing relationships with the students that we would ultimately serve. And for anyone who does this work, mm. you have to know that those relationships are literally the only things that kind of hold us in and together as we move forward in this space. And so once we were able to offer some courses inside, we were able to build those relationships. And then ultimately, as people were being released from the minimum security facility that we first started in, we were able to work with them more closely on college related things, but also employment related things. We know that, um, especially here in Connecticut, when folks get released, they're not really released with much or any money. And so students that are going to halfway houses or even just going back home um, who may be economically kind of strapped, um, we're able to provide some assistance to them to get some of the, the basic needs that folks have when they are released. The work in Second Chance has grown from sort of continuing ed, non-credit bearing work in one facility to credit bearing and continuing education work in a second facility, which is a maximum security facility. And we have about 25 students in our credit uh, 
our credit granting pathway in partnership with Southern New Hampshire University. We have about 40 students in that same facility doing continuing ed that we deliberately and transparently use as a feeder to get into our, uh, our credit granting work. So students know that they're working and kind of honing their skills in this non-credit system so that when they get to the credit space there, they're able to hit the ground running. Putting that work together meant that I was able to just kind of be involved in a lot of different conversations over the past couple of years. And one of the things that sort of arose, and I, and I actually want to credit you, Gerard, for your convening a few years ago, um, because, because that's where Dr. Muhammad and I started having conversations about what leadership in higher ed and prison as a field very broadly looks like. It's a very white led field. It's a very white woman led field. And what often happens is that the voices particularly of black women become silenced, um, become dismissed and, and get overlooked um, in order to kind of support more visible programs, et cetera, et cetera. And so out of that conversation, those conversations with Dr. Muhammad similar conversations with Dr. Bria Willingham, who is the, the three of three of our JAMI executive team, we realized that something needed to be done, that we had to um, kind of take a stand and, and move forward with the things that we know people in this space need. And so we formed the JAMI really have been designed to create and cultivate that space for Black women in this work. We also, you know, obviously have the support of, of folks in the field, but we are very deliberate and very um, and very sure about the need to support Black folks in this space. After we started Jami Sisterhood, we were like, okay, what are some sort of broader, larger projects that we can embark upon to really make sure, especially in the wake of all that happened in terms of the racial um, upheaval and unrest that we saw last year, how can we make sure in our little space here, because higher ed and prison is very niche, um, how can we make sure that black and brown folks are more represented as staff and teachers in these higher ed and prison programs um, so that the students who are mostly students of color, mostly men of color, as we know those statistics, how can we make sure that they are getting to experience representation in their own classrooms? And so the Jami Sisterhood received funding from the Laughing Gull Foundation to start Project Freedom, where we will work with 10 HBCUs. And I'm like, I'm looking at Wiley, Langston, and Shorter. Uh, well, we will work with HBUs to really round out a, a more robust um, new programs, make more, current programs more robust. Um, we have received interest from a number of HBCUs, some that I didn't even know existed. So it's been a learning experience, obviously, for me. But we're wanting to tap into, I think, what um, the good uh, Reverend Esquire, President Green was mentioning that this is part of our history. This is part of our culture, this service to community. And a story that I tell a lot that I'm sure Dr. Muhammad is sick of hearing um, <laughs> is when we look at uh, a place like Bennett College in Greensboro, we see that there is a very clear history of the connection between what's happening on campus and what's happening in prisons. And so when the Bennett Bells were helping the, the young men at a and plan the Woolworth sit-in as well as protests at the local movie theater and things like that, we know that those students were arrested. The president of Bennett was bringing homework into the prisons you know, basically say, I know you're out here fighting for, for justice, but you are not going to miss your calculus assignments. And so we really want to lean into that, lean into that history, lean into that community, because it is truly at the heart of who we are and where we are as a people and as a field of higher education and prison. I also want to touch on the piece about quality and standards that I am in whole complete agreement with in every possible way. And one of the things that will be happening with Project Freedom is the composition or the, the creation of a higher ed in prison quality index. And so the plan for that index is to take all of the information, all of the data that we collect with Project Freedom and from the schools that are participating to say, okay, these are the axes along which we are going to measure quality. We're going to look at 
intensity of reading, time spent outside of class doing work, um, how able are students to have study halls? What are your academic advising and career advised links, career advising services looking like for your inside students? Are you accommodating students with disabilities who are incarcerated? Because we know that there is a disproportionate percentage of incarcerated folks who have diagnosed disabilities. We also know that for the large part, higher ed and prison programs are not accommodating those students. Um, because many of those programs are also using very selective admission methods to get the best of the best. And we know what happens when that best of the best is not interrogated with a critical lens, i.e. a race-based lens, but also an equity lens when we're talking about accessibility for disabled peoples. And so again, we're looking at a number of things building upon the metrics framework done from the Institute of Higher Ed and of Institute of Higher Ed Policy to say, this is an excellent starting point. Now, how do we add on to make sure that we are covering a wide range of, of sort of, of silos that all come together in this one index? And, and we firmly believe that HBCUs absolutely should be at the forefront of that for this groundbreaking, field-changing work. HBCUs absolutely need to be at the forefront. And so, I hope that answered your question, Gerard. <laughs> oh, sure it did. You know, three really good points. Thanks for acknowledging people with disabilities, the special needs who are in prison, overlooked for a whole host of reasons. I'm on the uh, National Board of Respectability, and we represent people with disabilities. And so I know you're going to get some shout outs from there. And in fact, we've got work on our webpage to help uh, in that area. Number two, glad that you focus on Black women. You know, even though women make up only what 7% of the incarcerated population, women of color make up the majority of women who are in prison. But when you look at black women compared to, you know, how many black women per 100,000 who are incarcerated, that number is higher than anyone else's. You've got always that dynamics of intersectionality that get involved in these conversations. And uh, I remember something, this would have been I guess, a couple of years ago when um, Saritha at Operation Restoration talked about her story and then a white woman in the same presentation before the legislature says the same thing and yet they respond to her very differently and so these are dynamics that we have to be very careful of and she of course played a role in having louisiana get rid of the uh felony box on applications for school to being the first in the country and then third the shout out thanks that you gave me uh that was a meeting sponsored by the center for uh advancing opportunity uh partnership created between the thurgood marshall college fund Charles Koch Foundation and uh, Koch Industries, and a number of you are still involved with that. Here's a, a general question I'm gonna ask, and then we're gonna go into uh, the Q&A with the number of people who have uh, submitted something online. Also, if you wanna raise your electronic hand, I can look at that as well. We know you're offering, uh, some of you, degrees of credit bearing. We know you support GEDs for those who are incarcerated, but there's always a number of people who come up to me and say, listen, I just don't support any of this. You committed a crime, you should do the time. Why should I give you either A, a free college degree when I, as the victim of a crime, who's now raising a grandson or granddaughter, who was killed by someone who's now gonna get a free degree and I have to take out a second mortgage in my home for my uh, grandchild to go to college. So, you know, that's one. And then number two, there's just some people who believe prison is for punishment, not rehabilitation. That's a conversation that's over 200 years old. How do you respond when you hear those comments? Let me um, say something about that. Um, uh, first, uh, it is a short view to say that prison is only for punishment unless you're just going to kill them or keep them in there forever. Uh, because it is in everyone's best interest. It is in society's best interest for that person to be improved, uh, for that person to be uh, uh, a taxpayer, a contributor, a producer, uh, a giver rather than a taker. Uh, uh, so it's it's in everyone's best interest, uh, unless you're just going to take them out and shoot them, uh, no matter what the crime. Uh, the, 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 the second thing uh, is the, the Pell Grant eligibility 
is not giving uh, a person who's incarcerated anything that anyone else cannot get. This is simply a small grant uh, that is based on not having any money. So if you are not in prison and you don't have any money, you're eligible for a Pell Grant. And really, y'all are talking about about $5,000 uh, in the semester. So, so this is not something that that person who says uh, they're getting something my daughter can't get or son cannot get and they didn't commit a crime, that's not true. Uh, they are not getting something that any other citizen cannot get. They are receiving, what, what, what this program is about is removing um, uh, something that made them ineligible for something that everybody else could get. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. I would add to that and say, you know, uh, Gerard, that's such a good question. I get it all the time. I mean, prior to COVID, this was something that would pop up in Uber rides when I talk about, you know, what it is that I do. And, you know, individuals have a strong stance on it. And oftentimes I've saw more leverage when I talk about my research with children of incarcerated parents. So when you think about the collateral consequences of mass incarceration, the individual that is incarcerated is not the only victim. It is the victim that we look at, but oftentimes we find that education empowers the families and communities of those that are incarcerated. So they're sharing the programs that they're in. Uh, a lot of the children um, in my success research that I've done with the Center for Advancing Opportunity look specifically at the pathways to success and 87% of the children mentioned that the support from their incarcerated mothers and fathers that were in post-secondary education programs gave them the pipeline and the communication to be able to then apply. So they weren't interested in a Howard University, but their father who was incarcerated called and told them, I'm in a Howard program, we're doing this, you should Google, you should learn. And so they began to be the social capital on the inside that then breaks the school to prison pipeline on the outside. So when we're thinking about incarcerated individuals, we should not only be thinking about them, but their families who have done nothing. And that education helps those individuals who are connected to them and in their lineage. Also another piece um, that people uh, often forget about it that the doors of prison are revolving. Um, when you think about prisons, um, it's a little different, longer sentences, but in these jail settings, there are large numbers of individuals that are coming um, out. And when prisons were created, you know, individuals got a book. So it was about education and that book was the Bible. And so when we're talking about these different books in the humanities and in history, um, it really fits into that curriculum of people think that education is easy. And I'm just like, well, what world do you live in? Because the more that you learn about crimes that you may have committed, having to self-reflect the accountability, many of the students that I engage with, I mean, are much more remorseful, are much more critical, are very apologetic, uh, conscious as it relates to their actions and their families, and then have to carry that throughout the entire sentence. And therefore upon release, strong hit the ground and say, this is the avenue that I'm taking and not going back. I find that those individuals that miss programming, those individuals that don't get into those academic programs, oftentimes, unfortunately, and research has shown this, come out and end up going right back in. Mm. And so literally you pay you more money. It, it, it costs more money to the taxpayers than it does to have individuals that are able to have the social capital to communicate with their families and more importantly, to be the political actors in their community. So a lot of these individuals are coming out and doing phenomenal work in their communities to clean it up. And that costs less money from the governmental side. So literally when you think about it, you can't think about it just from that you know, small you know, point of view. This is a very dynamic conversation and these are very dynamic individuals that are connected to large communities of individuals that they're communicating with day in and day out. And if students that are incarcerated are good enough to bring in the top ivory towers, then why should we punish them even more for the sentences that they're serving during that for a secondary sentence to say that 
you're not worthy of being educated. It's not equitable. It, it, it doesn't fit into a democratic uh, society. And I think there's a lot of punishment in learning as well. And all of us that have gone up to those JDs and those PhDs, you know that it is not an easy feat. Um, and it's very difficult as it relates to that self-reflection. And I think that's an important piece. I actually hear that comment, Gerard, most or heard it most from the CEOs when mm -hmm. I would go inside the facility. I'm, you know, I'm a little bit of an introvert. And so I was kind of quarantining before quarantine was necessary. Um, and so never really got into a, a, a ton of conversations that yielded that comment. But the CEOs were very brazen about saying, why are you, why are you wasting your time? Why are you here? Why are you wasting your degree on, on these people, right? And so as they would follow up with that and they would, you know, lapse into the, you know, why them when I had to pay, my response is, I don't want anyone to have to pay for college, to be honest, <laughs> you know, here is a broader understanding of where I am coming from and where, you know, the institutions that I'm partnering with are coming from on college access and why college is not affordable for your regular everyday person because what we also have to remember and this took me a while to just kind of internalize especially in connecticut the average educational attainment for corrections officers is very similar to the educational attainment of the folks who are incarcerated meaning mm -hmm. that the ceos here in the state mostly only have a high school diploma and so there's a piece about just like college life and college going that is not part of their experience. And so in an, in an attempt to combat that, I said, all right, but what if I let y'all take the same free credential pathway as the students who are inside? All of a sudden there was silence, right? All of a sudden, all of that kind of rationale, back talk, rah-rah started to go away. Um, and, but, those who were still like, okay, well, let me give it a try, enrolled. And so we launched our first staff cohort last fall. And we're, we're in a space now in the second semester where the DOC students in our staff, we have a captain, we have a lieutenant, um, and we have one of the voc ed teachers who are like, I never would have looked at what I do this way without taking these courses that you're offering. We've had some folks, some of our students say to us, having these courses makes it really difficult to do my job. Taking these courses really makes it a struggle to put the uniform on every morning and go in and look at people in cages. And so that's part of the culture shift that has to happen. As much as, you know, I'm very much a, a prison abolitionist, as much as that is my, my, personal, um, my personal politic, I have to understand that the very circumstances that have led to me teaching my incarcerated students are often the very same circumstances that have led those COs into that position. In Connecticut, we have most of our prisons are in a town called Enfield. Um, it's the town business. And so you graduate from high school, you go and you work in the prison. For prisons that are in very rural areas, I would argue that there's a similar trend. And so we're, we're combating lack of education across the board. And we need to figure out how to make those shifts starting from the inside, but also from the outside working hand in hand. Those Gerard, are, mm -hmm. I, go ahead, Dean. I would just add quick, I certainly echo and agree with everything that's been said. I think when I get those questions, it's never from someone who's met a former incarcerated person it's from someone who's never been in a prison. And I, I believe part of our job as HBCUs and as educational institutions, we, we've got to tell this story better. We have to tell the story of our students better. We have to create opportunities to expose these students to people in business and industry, um, partnership programs, I think, Dr. Muhammad talked about some of the things they're doing that are, you know, bringing our students who are currently incarcerated together with uh, all different constituents and stakeholders. Pre-pandemic, we, we started an effort um, 
in, in business classes to bring in business leaders to the classroom. And um, for many of them, that was their first time to ever step foot in, inside a facility. And always they left with a different impression about these incredible students. And so I believe as a part of these programs, we've got to find ways to connect our students with industry uh, to tell their story, because I think that's the ultimate way to, to begin to change the narrative and for businesses to start hire, hiring these students for members of our community to start seeing uh, how important it is that we do this work together. Thank you, Dean. Go ahead. Again. All right. Yes, sir. Let, let me just weigh in. First of all, I like what all of you have said. Uh, you know, according to research, looking at the RAND survey study, which, you know, hinges very much on second chance Pell, people who receive a vocational or academic credential are 43 percent less likely to reoffend. And we know that that's fact. That's that's research. Also, when you take under consideration, when I when I walk into a prison, as a matter of fact, the first program that we started was at David Wade Correctional Center, where I spent three years of my life locked up at. Uh, and when I walk in there, after being out of prison for 25 years, I see sometimes some of the same men that I left in 1994 are still locked up in prison. When I get the question from someone who said, why waste your time? Why deal with folk who are locked up? They're just going to get out and, you know, reoffend and come back to, through the revolving door. I look at myself as an example. Everyone is not going to reoffend. I'm a taxpaying citizen. I love what I do. This is not a job to me. This is part of my ministry. I also am ordained minister here in Marshall, Texas. But I look at the money. We know it's a fact that every state spends between twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars per year on every person that's locked up in their facility. When you look at juvenile, that number jumps to about forty thousand to fifty thousand because you must provide them schooling and some other services. When we look at the Second Chance Pell program, you know, and I, I agree with Dr. Uh, uh, Green, this is you know, a, a tip in the bucket, what we're spending on these men and women to try to help rehabilitate them and give them another opportunity. When I look at the families at graduation, when, that, when the children walk in, man, that's the greatest sight in the world to see a, a, a person who has taken advantage of the educational opportunities in the prison. When that, that kid, I'm talking about that son, that daughter, that mama, that grandma, or grandpa, see that young man who's locked up in prison, taking advantage of an educational opportunity, which elders where I come from in the South always say to us, you know, you, once you get an education, no one can take that away from you. And, and people are proud to get education here in, in the South. So when I see education, those credentials uh, given to these young men who've earned them, man, this is the 100 piece of the puzzle for many of these men. And it makes their families so proud and make them proud, make them feel like, hey, when I get out of here, at least I have a tool that I can use to better myself and to contribute to my community. So, you know, when we start talking, but there is no comparison in my opinion to the amount of money that we spending, $5,000, $10,000 versus $30,000 for one year for a person to remain incarcerated. So when we talk about money and second chance pay, hey, let us continue to spend the money, give men and women an opportunity so that they can do better when they walk out of those gates. I'm about to say amen. <laughs> All right. God bless you. Look in the chat box. You got a couple of amens. And I think you have a couple oh. of virtual offerings coming to you through a Cash App. <laughs> Pray in the love. <laughs> I get a chance to look at a number of the questions. I'm going to uh, synthesize a few of them into one. For those of you who would like, you can raise your virtual hand. Tamara, at one point you had your virtual hand up. Feel free to do so, and I'll call uh, when I see. Uh, also want to thank uh, some of our other HBCU members who are on here, uh, Dr. Howard Henderson at Texas Southern, uh, Dr. Uh, Mons, uh, who is at Albany State, also part of the group. So we've got three hands that are up. Let me go to the top. And so Tamara, uh, go ahead. We won't see your face, but just go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay, so my name is Tamara Scroggins, and I am currently in rehabilitation counseling program at Langston University. 
I have, um, and I'm also a case manager and I've been a case manager for people with disabilities for uh, about four years. And I also uh, worked in the prison system for a couple of years as well. So, but what I've seen here is you guys have basically hit the mark. And as a case manager um, um, in the prison system, I see, uh, I know we talked, to, you guys talked about uh, like the staff and stuff. I don't see a lot of that. Like they don't see them as people. And when I walked in, I, I remember praying before I even walked in the prison and before I started working, I wanted to make sure that I treated each individual as a person. And they don't teach us that um, as the staff um, within the prison system. Um, and and it's, it's, really, it's really, really sad, but you guys are right on the mark. And I agree with everything you guys have said as far as the education and the lack of, um, uh, and I think I, I had said something earlier about, um, it, it kind of depends on, it kind of depends on the crime. Um, yeah. Because a lot of the time, yeah. do one favor. I want to make sure I give Nikki a chance to jump in as well. Get short on time. You want to ask a question or just uh, finish up on your, your comment? Oh, I'm sorry. Just the, a lot of the times, uh, you, it depends on the crime and edu the education and how you know people uh, and how people are able to get their education. But again, I appreciate your you guys' time and I and I I didn't know about this program, so it's it's very in informational. Thank you. Before any of you weigh in, Nikki, since uh, you have your hand up, feel free to go ahead and uh, ask a question or make a comment. Go ahead. And we'll, un we'll un unmute you on our end, or you can unmute yourself now. Go ahead, Nikki, you can, you can unmute now. All right, well, while we're waiting for Nikki to unmute, any of you want to weigh in on, uh, on what Tamara had to say? Okay. Oh, hello. Hello. Yeah. Yes, I'm Nikki Key, and I'm from uh, Shorter College in Little Rock, Arkansas. Hey, Dr. Green. Um, <laughs> I was, um, I was, I'm a student there, and I also, I've been incarcerated both federally and state. And um, I was with Dr. Uh, Ang Angus, he, and he's correct. Like it's hard to get a job after you you can get the you can get a doctor's degree and whatever. But if you're a felon, you I mean when you check that felony box, you know you can, if you steal something once in your life, you can't get a job anywhere. You know if you have a gun once in your life, you can't be around children. So it's so much that you can't do, even though you have an education. And I think people need to focus more, more on that. I mean, you can have all the education in the world, but if you can't do anything with it, what is the point in having the edge? So that stops people wanting to get the education. And I think a lot of these programs need to focus more on that as well. Because now I'm going to school just to be a mortician because I know I can deal with the dead. You know, nobody's going to argue with me with that. You know, mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's I mean, that's, that's a fact. That's heavy. Thank you, Nikki, again, for opening up your personal story. Um, and let's do one last thing since Lynette has a hand up. Lynette, go ahead and make a comment or make ask a question, and then we'll uh, allow everyone uh, to weigh in. So, Lynette. Uh, Hello. <laughs> Thank you for uh, having this platform. First of all, my heart really goes towards Second Chances. Um, I found out about Second Chances because I am with the AME Church and I do know Dr. Green and I'm still learning more about it, but I come from a, a family that have had people incarcerated. And so my question is, um, I love the piece of the education, but like the young lady said before, Nikki, if we don't uh, combine the efforts with those employers, then it's almost null and void. So is there a way that even while we're in, while they're in that second chance program, that we can find some employers that will support them or have them uh, work with them, come into there so that that way when they come out, they know that they have some place that they can go to find a job. Because when, what I, I worked in, I volunteered in a women's correctional facility and, and I loved, I learned as much from them as they learned from me. 
But um, I know that one of the problems was when they came out. And so we tried to provide them a, a, a platform where we had employers, people to help them with a place to stay, a, a transportation, you know, and all that stuff when they came out. So my question basically is, is there some collaboration that can be done with employers while they're in the second chance program before they come out? Thank you so much. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open it up to you. And now I got to be the heavy as well. All great things must come to an end. So we've got about five minutes before we have to close. So uh, we have uh, comments and questions. I'll leave it up to all of you. Um, I would love to join in. I want to I want to sure. thank the, the three folks who who um, shared their perspectives. And in particular, I want to address this to, to uh, Nikki and to Miss Lynette. One of the 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 credential that we're offering in our program is a bachelor's in business administration with a focus on entrepreneurship. We know like here in Connecticut, um, we pay very close attention to this um, database called the National Inventory of the Collateral Consequences of Conviction. And so it's this publicly available database that lists on the state level and the federal level what the occupational license or licensure bans are for what offenses for how long, et cetera. There are going to be hundreds, nay thousands, depending on the state you are in. And so that is why our program focuses so much on entrepreneurship. We have one of our students who was released in 2017, who has opened up a juice bar, and he is now employing people who have criminal convictions, right? And so it's this, it's this understanding that if this is the system that we have been provided with these sorts of systemically institutionally sanctioned barriers, how do we work outside of that and around it to make sure that folks who come out of our programs are able to um, succeed and thrive in, in their own lives and in their communities? And so I think that one, so my recommendations are one, programs should really become familiar with that inventory as they are thinking about the programs that they are putting forth in the facilities. My second recommendation is to have some kind of emphasis on entrepreneurship and the ways that people can secure, if not loans, apply for grants, find other ways to secure funding um, so that they can start their own businesses that in turn can employ other folks with criminal convictions. Thank you. So I would echo that, that um, what Dr. Corbett said, I think entrepreneurship, computer science, coding, uh, all these opportunities where there's some, there's less limitation on those jobs as they come out. And then I would just reiterate my prior point that we've got to get more businesses into these programs um, and do joint internship programs and apprenticeship programs. Uh, undoubtedly, as we start to, to build those relationships, it will knock down those barriers. So, so glad to be here, Gerard, and thanks again for this opportunity and incredible dialogue. Look forward to many more. Thank you. Uh, Gerard, let, let me just um, uh, commend you for, for the leadership that you have provided in this space and for bringing us all together for this program. Uh, today. I think it has been uh, very helpful, very beneficial, uh, and informative, and encouraging, uh, not only to those of us who participate, uh, but to others who may not have known uh, that there was a, a significant movement and persons committed uh, to this issue. Uh, I want to um, acknowledge Nikki, who is our student, and uh, Reverend Lynette, who is one of our second chance uh, Pell faculty members uh, to remain encouraged. And uh, let me just say that when we started down this journey, we knew that there were structural impediments uh, such as checking the box uh, that had to be overcome. And that's one of the reasons that the primary uh, uh, degree that we offer through our Second Chance Pell program is entrepreneurial business. In fact, that's why we developed entrepreneurial business as a major in the first place, uh, because when you serve a disadvantaged uh, population, uh, 
uh, sometimes there's not a whole lot of difference between the folk who you have on campus and the folk who are uh, uh, who have been incarcerated. Uh, they come from the same place. Uh, and unless they get to the college uh, before they get to the prison, then they have to come back and make a loop. Uh, so one of our attempts to level the playing field is to offer a course of study that is not just um, uh, academic, but to offer uh, a, a course of study that will allow them to be entrepreneurs and to create their own jobs using uh, the skills that we have been able to give them in the course of getting that degree. Uh, now, having said that, however, um, one of we got we have a couple of objectives uh, at Shorter College that we're working on. Uh, one is for our placement office to do just what um, some of the callers suggested, and that is to develop relationships with employers who will hire people who have a felony uh, record uh, so that uh, they know that there are at least these employers out there. And the second thing is all of us need to lobby at the state level, at the local level, uh, and at the national level uh, to do something about checking the box uh, so that there is some legal protection in place so that this population is not, um, is not treated differently than others who have the same qual qualifications strictly because of their past. Thank you, Mr. President. And I would just end by saying, I know we're at time now um, to also consider incarcerated individuals as uh, scholars, looking at research methodologies, as well as teaching experiences. We know we have the convict criminology where individuals are receiving their degrees and then coming out and teaching specifically at HBCUs. Um, there are a few professors on our campuses that are doing a phenomenal job um, in this area. And so thinking about ways of increasing master's level and PhD level educational services during incarceration, I think um, is something that we should begin to further think about. I know we've offered graduate classes on the Howard University level and individuals were surprised that on the incarcerated side, we had a full class of master's and PhD students during incarceration combined with our um, graduate and PhD students on the outside. And so um, we should be innovation, innovative and creative and not thinking about the judgments that we have for those of our brothers and sisters that are in carceral spaces and really change the next generation through the use of uh, creativity in these spaces. Thank you so much, Gerard. This has been phenomenal. Thank you. Dr. Andrews. First of all, I want to say thank you also, uh, Brother Gerard. Thank you for allowing us to be here. Uh, I would also say that we must use our advocacy power. Uh, you know, we can talk all we want, but th the bottom line is this, especially in small areas where we're able to galvanize and bring people together. If Frito Lay does not hire ex convicts, maybe I don't need to eat Frito Lay. I need to go elsewhere. We have to use leverage. We have to use our advocacy. Anything that we support, we advocate for. So same thing with ex-felons ex coming out of prison or returning citizens. We want to make sure that we advocate with these jobs, with these employers, to let them know, hey, look, if you're not hiring, we're not buying. Bottom line, that's how you get people's attention. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I want to thank all of you. Unfortunately, we, uh, Drs. Muhammad and Covert actually pulled off. I want to thank both of them for the work that they're doing uh, in their individual space. I want to thank you, uh, Dean, for the work you're doing at uh, Langston University. I want to thank you for the, not only the prison visits, but you talked about the warden. I had a chance to have a conversation with the warden and leadership. And the leadership is very clear. They see this as a part of what they're doing. So thank you for your work. Uh, Dr. Andrews, I want to thank you for your work. I had a great time on your campus. People thank should you. go to the largest, I think, I think, discipline at Wiley College of people studying criminal justice. So you're going to have a generation of people uh, leaving there, going to become not only police officers working in government, but also scholars like yourself in the area. And it's worth noting, he's also an entrepreneur. He has a business where he's actually hiring people. Absolutely. Walking 
And it's also worth noting, I won't go into it too much, he's had a personal tragedy in his own life uh, within the yes. past year and a half, which is leading to legislation in the state of Louisiana. So he is also someone who's been a victim of some of this through his own family. And yet he right. said, I still want to move forward. So thank you for being a living example. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, President Green, I want to thank you not only for your leadership, but being one of the presidents who said, I'm going to do this. I've spoken to presidents who said, I think it's great. It's just not what I want to do. Uh, but you said it is. And so that's great leadership for you. Had a chance to come to your campus a couple of times. You're one of the largest, in fact, producers of people earning credentials incarceration in the state of Arkansas. Yeah. So well, thank you for your vision. My last two cents as we're talking about HBCUs, one of the uh, most important conversations I had with the funder uh, took place decades ago with um, uh, former president of Virginia Union and North Carolina a and um, um, I see his face right now. Um, it'll come to me in a second. We were having a meeting with um, Dr. Samuel DeWitt Proctor. We were having a meeting with a very important funder uh, in, uh, in one state. Uh, and this funder said with all candor, do we really need HBCUs today in America? And Dr. Uh, Samuel Proctor, not having heard this for the first time said, that's a good question, but I have a better question. The better question is, where would America be without the HBCUs? Moving it from the object of the conversation uh, to the subject. So that's number one. This conversation is important. Millions of people, African Americans and others, will benefit because of the role that HBCUs play, whether they're in the second chance program now, joining, or in the future. But again, these things matter. Number two, I am wearing my Howard University shirt. I'm a graduate of Howard. But in 1980. Uh, nine. Uh, I met a young lady who involved me in a project sponsored by the DC Superior Court System called the HITS program, High Intensity Training Seminar. And it was that program that gave me a chance for two years to work with justice involved youth who had one foot on the banana peel, one foot on jail or incarceration. And it was through that where I realized the number one thing they said they all wish they would have had differently was a great education. And so that was one of the five uh, influences on my life that made me decide to become a fifth grade school teacher when I graduated from Howard. So I've been involved with this going back to the 80s. I want to thank all of you who are involved. I want to thank, again, Chancellor uh, Zuckerberg Initiative for the investment. I want to thank my partners in this work, everyone from R Street, the American Enterprise Institute, Prison Fellowship, to the Vera Foundation, FAM, Operation Restoration, Stan uh, Andrews, who's back as a professor at Howard University, and a group of people who come from different walks of life but decide to walk on this one lane to say that education matters. We want to give second chances. And for this month of Black History Month, we want to celebrate the work of HBCUs. Thank for you for all you do. I'll have, I have your emails because you have uh, signed up and we'll make sure to keep you abreast of the work we're doing here at the Band Studies and Culture Foundation. Thank you for your time.